Welcome to Robots in Depth. Today I'm honored to have Daniel LaFaro here, and we're going to talk about everything in robotics like we usually do. Uh, and we're going to start the regular way. How did you get into robotics? When did you discover you could build things that move around in the real world rather than just code? Oh, why robotics? Yeah, why robotics? Well, it's my question to everyone is why not robotics? Robot That's also my question. <laughs> Robots are awesome. Um, there's no reason why anyone shouldn't be obsessed with them. So I go by a motto um, that I work very hard to make my life easier. And robots are a way to do that. That's also why I'm into robotics. I love all the stuff you can do with computer coding. For this project, I've coded away all the boring stuff. But I'm envisioning a world where you can do the same thing for physical tasks. Mm -hmm. Like we're now doing with cutting our grass. If you have a big lawn, you have an automated lawnmower, and it just works a treat. Yep. And co-robotics, that's the future. Mm. Um, so for those who don't know what that is, it's, it's connecting, having people be able to work next to and work with robots instead of in the normal industrial setting where you have a robot inside of a big cage or behind this big yellow line that you're not allowed to cross, otherwise you'll be cut in half. Mm. Because in general, these industrial robots are very stiff. They're very strong, and us humans, we're very squishy. Uh, so that means that we are going to get hurt if the robot hits us, and the robot's not even going to notice that it hit us. And it's not, it doesn't have the perception to go in and say, OK, there's a human. It's got a very simple, if you cross the line, it's stops, right? It's well, not intelligent in any way. It's maybe. not intelligent, and if you cross around, it won't stop. Mm. It's it's up to us to mm. protect ourselves. Mm. Now, with a co-robot, mm. that's something that we could work next to. So mm. it can hand us tools. Mm. Uh, it could screw in something while we're doing something else. Mm. Um, it could hold a big heavy piece while we do the screwing. Exactly. Mm. And so their, their actuators are made to be uh, more elastic, uh, softer. Um, so when you push it, it'll give, just like a human. If you push mm. them, they're not going to stay perfectly rigid mm. uh, like a robot traditionally would. Mm. And this will allow them to actually work next to us uh, to share common space uh, with humans. Mm. And that's exciting. And that's the way we interact with most machines in today. So, I mean, you don't fear yeah. your copy or your stove <laughs> or your washing machine no, or you your don't. car. I mean, the car must be the, uh, the ultimate co-machine. We're actually in the machine yep. And, yep. And, and constantly operating the machine as we do. Uh, so, yeah, I think that this is the, the, by far the largest part of the market. Mm -hmm. And it opens up so many different fields. And it's going to make everybody feel like a superhero because they can do these things that we today are not even collectively able to do. So, yep. uh, What do you see as the major challenges uh, to get there? All right, so there's two big things. Hmm? First of which is free, and the other one is very expensive. Free, I'm sorry all you programmers out there, but software should be mainly open source, mm -hmm. and it's your artificial intelligence, mm. AI. Um, that needs to improve dramatically so we can, they can actually do tasks that we want them to do so that they can deal with our complex and ever-changing world. Um, so AI is something that technically doesn't cost anything to reproduce um, and is a big game changer. Mm. And big companies, you know, Google, Amazon, Uber, all know that this is a game changer, that they're putting a lot of money into AI right now. Mm, all of them, huh? Yep. And I guess both three-letter agencies yes. and, and research labs are mm -hmm. also on this, right? Yeah, yeah. DOD, DARPA, those mm. places. Uh, NSF is big into it mm. as well. Mm. Um, but the second thing, mm. which not everyone thinks about, mm. is cost. We need to start mass producing these items. We need to... Uh, we can't have a robot such as the wonderful Hubo series, which costs over $400,000 a piece. And what can it do? It can walk around and it can fall. <laughs> and I love that robot. But it's $400,000 for something that can't do much of anything uh, in our everyday lives. Now, if that was $10,000 or $20,000, the price of an automobile, and it can do your dishes, it can make you dinner, it can vacuum your floor and things like that and last 20,000 steps or 100,000 steps, just like you expect an automobile would last 100,000 miles. Oh, $20,000 lasts you 10 years, great. That's acceptable. Yeah. And right now, since many of these things are 
uh, one-offs or for the example of Hubo, we have about uh, 16 uh, Hubo 2 Pluses out there and um, I guess about eight uh, DRC Hubos. Those are small numbers. But if you start making these things in quantity, just like cars, hmm. custom cars are very expensive. But buy a Honda Civic for $20,000 or less. And those are good cars. They're just done in quantity. Mm. In one way, they actually get better by maybe make, being made in quantity because we all know that your favorite super sports car is going to spend a lot of time in the workshop, yep. but your Honda Civic is just going to run for 20 years because they have different focus. And you also, as a programmer and as a developer, you also know this, that the more input you get, the more feedback you get, the more bugs you can get out of it. And uh, that is also, we have both the cost thing. If you do more of them, they're going to be cheaper but we're also going to make them better by having more testers out there that's going to call us up and scream at us, it doesn't work, and then we can fix it. Yeah, so that is a great point. And what we need for robots is a killer app. And I don't mean that the robot's going to murder us. I mean that it's the next Angry Birds. Um, the iPhone. Hmm. I love my iPhone. I use Apple, although I am switching to Android for various reasons. <laughs> um, I started using the iPhone because someone showed me how to play Angry Birds. Yeah. I'm sorry, it's just an obsessive game. Mm. And I think a lot of people are that way. Mm. Sure, the video conferencing is good, you know, you get to have your calendar, but I have games in my pocket all the time, and that is great. Mm -hmm. it, it fills those voids of time that we don't, uh, we don't have anything else to do. Mm. Um, robots, we need something uh, for robots that are as obsessive, that are as awesome that and as useful for the robots. And now, if there's a lot of them out there, uh, they use a ubiquitous framework, um, then you have a large user base and they can program apps such as a uh, kitchen cleaning app, a vacuuming app, and people can make their own, upload them to the robots, maybe sell, even sell them on the uh, robot store. Mm. And that would be the future, because now you're crowdsourcing applications. It's not Apple that puts out all of the um, all of these uh, games. No, Apple didn't do Angry Birds. No, Apple Rovio didn't do did. Mine. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, Rovio made Angry Birds, and mm. they are, and but it made Apple more money than it made Rovio. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, Having this ecosystem, getting it out there, and, and, and cost uh, and also features is a, is a very big problem yep. for robotics today. They're very, very, very expensive for what you get back, and yes. that is a huge challenge. Yep. But how do we solve the chicken and egg for the robotics world? How do we get the price of the hardware down? Uh, but be before that, nobody's going to develop an app for uh, a robot that only eight people have access to. But nobody's going to develop a hardware where there's no. How do we? How do we kickstart this? How do we? How do we get this going? Well, so that, that's a good question, and I think it does require a bigger company to do something. In this case, it wasn't a company. Uh, this is DARPA, uh, the Defense Advanced Research um, Agency. Uh, what they've done in the past with the uh, DARPA Grand Challenge with the autonomous vehicles, they said. They see a future for autonomous systems in our everyday lives, i.e. autonomous vehicles. Mm. So, all right, they wanted you to drive, what, it was 170 miles through the desert autonomously. They did it twice. The first year, no one succeeded. The second year, multiple teams succeeded. Mm. All right, they're like, well, let's, let's move to the urban challenge. So now they did the same thing inside of an urban setting. People were, uh, the robots were able to read the road signs, they were able to stop, they were e able to go, obey traffic, avoid pedestrians, avoid other cars. Then what did the uh, government do? Nothing. They handed it off to industry, because then they could see that there is use for it. Now what are we seeing? Google cars, right? Mm. Autonomous vehicle, the mm. Tesla mm. is now autonomous. Yeah, and, and it's uh, actually handling, I would say, from a time perspective, for most people, stop and go in, in, in traffic, and highway is 90% of what you drive, right? Yep, and the key point here is though, um, DARPA, mm -hmm. government agency, saw a need uh, for autonomous systems in our everyday lives in order to better our lives. And it wasn't cost beneficial for companies yet to put up the money. So as what our government should do, mm -hmm. they want to help make our lives better, 
and they put up the money initially to get excitement about it to show that it is feasible. Hmm. And they did it, and now the bigger companies have gotten uh, a hold of it, and they're doing great things with it. Hmm. Now with the DARPA Robotics Challenge, the most recent one uh, from 2012 to 2014, um, uh, 2000, uh, 2012 to 2015, hmm. uh, they are uh, do the same thing with humanoids. So have an adult-sized humanoid robot be able to drive a car, open a door, turn valves, go up steps, go over rough debris, use human tools, etc. Just to uh, push that boundary to try and get companies a little bit more excited about these things. Uh, we saw uh, Google, after this started, uh, they purchased a bunch of robotics companies, including Boston Dynamics. So it's, a, it's very exciting to see that uh, even privately owned companies are getting excited about robots at the moment. Amazon, excited about uh, UAVs, that's one thing, but they use robots in almost everything in their company. Uh, from moving around their supplies to now they even have the Amazon picking challenge where they want to have robots actually pick the items out of the um, uh, the carry uh, the um, shelves that the robots carry to them. Uh, so it's really exciting that again the bigger companies are getting involved now, mm. and that and that stems from. Uh, DARPA again, the DARPA Robotics Challenge. And DARPA and their previous ARPA was of course the, the, the father of the internet to a large degree too. So oh. they've done this for quite a number of times and, and they, they can be successful on a, on a scale that's hard to believe in many times. So. Not even to a larger scale. Uh, ARPA, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it's what DARPA used to be mm -hmm. as you stated, uh, was the father of mm. the internet. Mm. The first connected computer mm. uh, was I believe in 1969. Mm and it was called ARPANET. Mm. Uh, and so that was the birth of what will eventually become the internet. Mm. Uh, where do you think we are in this spectrum? Are we 85, 95, 2005? I'd say we're in the very early 80s or late 70s. Mm. Now the reason for this is, uh, one of the big reasons uh, why the internet exploded I mean, again, you know we had the internet for over a decade uh, before AOL uh, had its uh, AIM instant messenger, right? Uh, why, did, why was AIM so popular? Because everyone had it. It was mm. ubiquitous. Mm. Um, why did websites become popular? Well, because they all use the same protocol, HTTP, right? Things standardized. We started to be able to use one thing on different hardware. Uh, so everyone could view it. And that's what the, made the internet boom, mm. right? making things run on other things. Mm. Robots are not there yet. Uh, it is difficult to run the same software on the same series of robots, let alone a, totally, a robot with totally different ki kinematic configuration. Mm. So we need a standardization. That's why I think we're even before um, you know, the internet as we know it, uh, uh, the, even the early internet as we know today. Uh, we, we need to standardize. Yeah, I fully agree with you. Standards are absolutely essential. I'm also a fan of open source. I am loving the ROS operating, uh, robot operating system. What's your point of view on ROS? Where are they now? Are they... ROS, yes, okay. Well, let me start off with saying that, <laughs> yay, you guys have done a great job. Mm -hmm. You put a community together. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's the big thing about Ross is people put a lot of time and effort into adding functionality. Ross itself, mm -hmm. I apologize, is far from a good system. Mm -hmm. uh, every build breaks things in the previous build. So you can't run, and this is a, this is a huge problem, mm -hmm. uh, you can't run uh, something that ran on an older version with a newer version. Um, it's just, can't do it. It doesn't run in real time, which is what we need uh, for robotics. I'm talking about high frequency, real time, guaranteed delivery. And that's purely because of just how it was originally designed. It does what it needs to do, um, but those were not its focus. They do have ROS 2.0 that they're working on, which is hitting on these um, subjects I speak of, mm -hmm. um, but it hasn't been released yet. There's a beta version out. Mm -hmm. um, but so they're also aware of these issues. Oh yeah, yeah, they're very aware. Um, <laughs> I've been known to not be a fan of ROS, but again, that's because I'm big into real-time systems, yeah. and ROS is 
excessively far from a real time. But system. with this 2.0 effort that I've heard about uh, that is coming out, yeah. is that raising your hope in any way? Yeah, so 2.0, it's, it's, it's exciting. So what they say that they're working on is they're putting stuff, uh, working on real time guarantees, um, uh, package receival guarantees, mm -hmm. uh, as well as making it lighter weight. Ross, when you install the full package, it was over three gigabytes. Why? Um, so now they're also trying to make it run on much less powerful systems, uh, such as you know these single board computers like Raspberry Pis or Android phones, etc. Mm -hmm. um, that way, you know, we can run on Internet of Things, which is you know the new hot topic out mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. But so that, that gives me hope. Um, and how long time have they told us anything <laughs> about when this is going to be available and what, what's your take on, on that? I believe, if memory serves me correctly, that they were supposed to already have released the version. Mm. Um, but as with everything, uh, things get slow. That's fine. But remember, this is an open source movement. Mm -hmm. So they're not necessarily getting paid to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we would need something, uh, again, from DARPA to... Mm. Uh, make it better. Mm -hmm. So again, with the DRC, uh, there was a, uh, back in 2011, uh, there was a few major simulators for uh, robots, mm -hmm. two of which, OpenRave, mm -hmm. the other one was Gazebo. Mm -hmm. They were both, they're both fine, and they both had their problems. Um, the DARPA Robotics Challenge adopted Gazebo for their uh, simulator. Now, with that came a lot of money to put in real development into it. Still open source. Now, Gazebo is far superior to OpenRave and is a quality system that people can get up and running very quickly and get good data out of and get good simulation out of. Mm. And that was with only a little bit of money. Um, and a little bit of effort for the, uh, you know, DARPA Robotics Challenge. So I think uh, what needs to happen is another initiative to uh, standardize these robotic platforms, find out what's needed, and build something, because we can do it. Mm. Uh, just, we can't do it as a side project. Mm, no, and and here uh, and I think the Ross community is already contributing as much as they can. Oh yeah, somebody else has to come in from from the side and realize that this is very important. Yeah, and this has to be done. And as you say, if you compare it to many other government program, it's going to be very little money that's going to return so much to society. Yeah. So we really can hope we can encourage somebody to 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 take care of this. Again, to reiterate, the Ross community—that's what makes Ross good. Yeah, yeah. Um, most people that use ROS, they will complain about how ROS doesn't connect, it doesn't uh, transmit data well, etc. Mm. But they use this, this, and this package, and it works. Mm. So it's not something mm. uh, you know that the Open Source uh, Robotics Foundation made. Mm. Uh, they're just using their IPC, their inter process communication, mm. to use package some packages someone else made. Mm. You know, it's kind of like the uh, not. Almost like the printing press for robotics, mm. right? Um, you're able to make an app, send it out to other people, now they can use it. Just like you know, you're able to write a story or uh, an article, print it out and share your ideas with other people. Mm. Same thing with Thingiverse mm. and 3D printers. Now you can have an idea, you can upload it, and suddenly it can materialize somewhere else. Doesn't that sound like something interesting? Star Trek, right? Mm. A replicator. It's like uh, making. We're entering a Star Trek, Star yeah. Trek world. It's amazing. It's not quite, uh, you know, make me a cup of Earl Grey hot, um, but you can say make me a cup, mm. and it'll do that. Mm. It's no, I just need to work on the Earl Grey part. Yeah, so that's, that's not that bad. But it is, it, it is an amazing time, and uh, I really hope that we can keep the the operating system, the software, the st and and even keep the standards open source it doesn't mean the hardware have to be open source but the standards for them connectors control systems schematics and stuff so that everybody can build stuff to add to it or add on it or build with it uh, do you see any alternative to ROS or is ROS we have to save it because that's <laughs> the only way to do it or do you see any other roads ahead oh yeah I, I think there are other roads to uh, ahead you know there's again 
ROS 2.0. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of there course. is, uh, you know, I hate to toot my own horn, but you know, ACK-based systems, mm -hmm. uh, which is, uh, for example, HuboAC, which is a system mm -hmm. that uh, can talk to either remote or local processes, uh, just like ROS can, but in high speed, real time, very low latency, which is ideal for things like humanoids, which is what I work on. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, uh, you know, barring those, there's no great unified framework, and that needs to happen. Hmm. Hmm. Do you see, uh, I mean, you're aware of this, and I presume others to be, do you see a, a movement towards this solution for this problem? I mean, no. Are people talking about it? No. So we, I do not, this is, a, this is a problem, I do not see anyone moving towards it. Everyone does their own in-house version, hmm. right? Uh, so Russ Tedrick up at MIT, they have an absolutely wonderful real-time UDP connection between MATLAB and their robots, so they get really low latency, so you get you know kilohertz speeds, um, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's their solution, works on some things, but you know, then Georgia Tech's gonna have their own, right? Purdue's gonna have their own, uh, George Mason's gonna have their own. Uh, it's faster to do an in-house thing and just get it done for your real research as opposed to do something mm -hmm. overall. Because you have to talk to a lot of people and coordinate a lot mm -hmm. of stuff and, and it takes, it's faster because you can go, go straight and you don't have to do something that's general, which takes longer time. You can do something that suits your particular niche yeah. case. So what there needs to be mm -hmm. is a robot operating system. Yes. I am not talking about ROS mm -hmm. because that is what ROS stands for. Mm -hmm. ROS is not an operating system. It is an inter-process communication, it's mm -hmm. a communications framework. Mm -hmm. An operating system mm -hmm. is something that stands directly mm -hmm. between the hardware and the software. So we need, to the, need, we need to have this like a Ubuntu for robots. Something where you can install it on any machine and it works. You can open up a browser, you can open up OpenOffice, and you can now surf the web. You can now type a document. We need to have something where it has all the common uh, drivers for robots, uh, for all the common robots, the common uh, inverse kinematics for these robots, uh, common ways to uh, do path planning. So you can say, robot, go over there. And it might not use the most efficient and, and the latest and greatest method, but it'll do a method that works pretty darn well. And this was proven to, to work. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So again, you know, the out of the box Ubuntu is not the best. People usually, uh, you know, tweak it to their own needs. You know, or there's uh, things like Gen 2, which is really tweaked to their own needs. Mm. But most people are perfectly fine with it just works well enough. Mm. And that's what needs to be made. Mm. But there's no funding for that at the moment. Mm, that's something we, mm -hmm. we have to work on, absolutely. Yeah, we have to have people full time to just put it out. Once there is a base system mm -hmm. that has uh, the major things, mm -hmm. what has happened? People contribute because now they want their robot that mm -hmm. in there, right? Oh, I need this one in there. Oh, I just made this new uh, general IK software. We're going to put that in there too. So that's what needs to happen. Mm -hmm. right. And also companies will start to develop, uh, develop additions and products around this. Uh, yep. Like we've seen for the WordPress community, it's just you can get a plugin for, for things you didn't know you needed. <laughs> Yeah, let's look at the video game industry. Mm. Um, let's go back to the 80s. Mm. What, what wasn't much in the form of video gaming at that well, time. Well, well there was plenty of video gaming in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, the, the console but thing. But it was all on either a console mm. or Windows. Mm. Because that was the one that was uh, the programmers uh, programmed on. Most people had them. Mm. Okay, it was just a large market uh, you know, uh, share. Mm. Now... No, it, it's not quite 90%, 99% Windows anymore. Mm -hmm. A large portion have either a Mac or a Linux computer. Mm -hmm. So what has happened? Steam has happened, mm -hmm. which is uh, something that can run on multiple different platforms, including Linux. Mm -hmm. So now we can have a Linux computer and still play Unreal Tournament. Mm -hmm. Because that's what people want to do. Mm -hmm. So the support for... Um, other operating systems that aren't just Windows is increasing and increasing, right? Mm -hmm. So, Do you see any hardware issues we need to work on? We've talked about the software and standards and mm -hmm. stuff, but is there a sensor type or is, a, is there an actuator type you think, we really need this because otherwise it's going to be hard to make them work? 
right. Well, material. Uh, so the biggest thing that's going to uh, change robotics is materials. Absolute biggest thing. Uh, because we already have some really good tech out there, but you make it stronger and lighter, <laughs> you just made it better. A hmm. uh, cell phone uh, weighing a kilo isn't that interesting. One weighing 100 yeah. grams is very interesting. And so you start uh, making uh, stronger alloys that are also a lot lighter. So now you can change your harmonic drive, which is steel, mm -hmm. uh, with something that is some other alloy that is significantly lighter. And now uh, you don't need as much power to move your robot, which means you don't need as large of a battery. Or let's say you uh, make a more efficient battery. Uh, right now, you know, the Hubo series robot, you know, she'll stand around for two hours, but she'll move around for less than 45 minutes. So it's, it, that's not a full day. Mm -hmm. we, we wouldn't use our cell phones if they only lasted for 45 minutes. Um, so if we look at robotics in total and we see where are you most optimistic uh, about the general public actually being able to use a robot? I guess it's not a humanoid because those are complicated devices uh, compared to a vacuum cleaner. What's the next vacuum cleaner, so to speak? I would actually argue that the thing that's going to make robotics ubiquitous with everyone is a humanoid robot. Because of its generality, it can be applied in many situations? Exactly. Or? So humanoid robots are the Swiss army knives of robotics. They can do everything. They don't do everything well. Uh, a humanoid robot can pick up a box. Uh, a crane can pick up a box that's a lot heavier, so it can do a better job. But when was the last time you saw a crane driving a Honda Civic down a highway? Mm. Right? Mm. A humanoid robot can do that as well. And that can make you a sandwich. It can vacuum your floor. Uh, they are very useful. Mm. Um, and the same robot is useful for many days. Exactly. You don't have to make custom ones that make yeah. them expensive. You don't have one car that takes you to school. You don't have one car that takes you to the grocery store. You don't have one car that takes you to the park. Mm. You don't have one car that takes you into the city, right? Mm. Mm. That's silly. Mm. Why would you even think about that? Mm. Oh, you know, because city roads are different than mm. the park roads. Mm. So, you know, we have to go on gravel here. No. Uh, you have one car for all of this. Mm. So why would you have more than one robot for all of this? Mm. You already have the vacuum cleaner. Mm. And that's why it has to be human shape, right? Mm. Because the form follows function. Mm. If it, our world is made for humans. Mm. It has doors that open, right? Mm. Uh, it has light switches you switch. Um, it's made for things that have two arms, two legs, and a head. In fact, most robots should be right-handed because our world is made for right-handed people. 90% um, of the human population is right-handed. So. Yeah, yeah, very interesting. And and I, why I like the humanoids are the generality that, the, the, I mean, they can potentially and theoretically do anything a human can do. Do you see them coming down from the 400,000? Oh, yeah. No, they, they're definitely going to get cheaper. In 2008, Jamie Hubo, uh, one of the best human robots ever, um, she's now down at uh, UNLV, uh, at our partner lab, uh, Dassel at UNLV. Mm -hmm. uh, she cost $1 million in 2008. It's 2016 now, eight years later, you can buy a superior robot to Jamie, um, and uh, approximately same size, weight, etc., for under $400,000. Dropped over half in cost. Yeah. Partially, be and this is partially because at the time, when Jamie was made, that's a KHR4 model, mm -hmm. there was Jamie and Gyopo. Mm -hmm. So two of them, mm -hmm. that's it. Mm -hmm. Now, the two pluses, which are the superior versions but are almost mm -hmm. identical to the other ones, uh, mm -hmm. minus hardware, uh, both electrical and um, mechanical upgrades, mm -hmm. Uh, they were made in quantity, hmm. right? There's about 16 of those out there. Hmm. Uh, you know, they were uh, sold to you know the U.S., Singapore, hmm. places in Korea, China. Um, so because even at a small quantity like that, they were able to half the price. Hmm. Mm. That's exciting, mm. right? Yeah, and uh, halving the price kind of adds a zero to your market uh, potential market. If you go from two, they they might even come up to a hundred in the long run, and and the next one adds it goes up to a thousand, and it goes to forty thousand mm. or or hundred thousand. So yeah. So hardware can be fixed with economies of scale, mm. right? Mm. Mm. 
So Mark Tilden can talk to you about that. You know, mm -hmm. you make one widget, you know, it might cost you 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. You make 50,000 widgets, it can cost you a dollar each. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So economies of scale. Um, that's that's going to be hardware. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. But economies of scale is not going to fix the artificial intelligence. Well, this is where the robotic app store comes into play. Mm -hmm. Right? Because mm -hmm. again, you're saying we don't need the artist. Oh, maybe we do, maybe we don't. We don't need, we're not asking for the general thinking robot. I'm asking for a robot that can do my dishes. Mm -hmm. Download the app for that. Yes, I will pay $20 for an app for that. Oh, certainly. You know, oh, I need a, a robot to vacuum my floor. Mm -hmm. Yes, I will pay $20 for an app for that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the community making these specific ones that. Yeah. Oh, so you want to download it so we can do everything, you know, and the kitchen sink. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, your kitchen sink is leaking. An app for that <laughs> to fix that. Imagine when there's an app to, f to, to download your robot that does physical things that yeah. carry my luggage to the car robot or whatever. Exactly. So there would be silly, um, silly little things that it's going to be an app that makes the robot yeah. snap its fingers, right? Yeah. And that's all we'll do. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, the community will make the things that it knows it needs. Mm -hmm. Because there's people like me out there that work very hard mm -hmm. to make their lives easy. Mm -hmm. And thus it'll hopefully help everybody else. Very interesting. Thank you very much for taking the time. Uh, I appreciate you doing an interview. Well, thank you very much for having me. This episode is sponsored by Aptomica. Everything you need in modular robotics. Or robots up close. What's going on in robotics online? and on the road. If you like this interview, don't forget to subscribe, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to our email newsletter on robotsindepth.com. You can also support the show on Patreon.